Well, happy Halloween, everyone. It is a horror fan's favorite day of the year, and for this holiday, I brought you something special. That's right, no tricks this time. It's the ring timeline. I, I know I've been putting them off for like, like forever, but it, it was due to a little trouble tracking down a couple of the movies and then just timing. But with a new entry of the series coming out shortly in Japan, I figured now was the time. So how about it? Will the timeline make sense? Uh, I figured I'd do that little girl in the well a favor and help her in figuring out her own continuity. What's that you say? I wasn't supposed to help her. Well, damn. Okay, this probably doesn't actually start where you think, but we begin back in 1995 with Ringu, or just Ring, but not the Ringu that you've likely seen. Based on the 1991 novel, this was actually a made-for-television version of the story, and we begin with a young woman alone at night, and right away, something is after her. It gets her, and at the same time, Kazuyuki witnesses a man dying on a motorcycle. He's a reporter, and he discovers that there were four people that died at the same time from a mysterious heart failure. There's a subplot with a psychic that may be a fraud and caused Kazuyuki to get demoted, and it turns out that all four of the victims were at a resort together, so he goes to check it out. There's a guest book here, and it looks like the crew signed it in early June, so that's the month that we're set in, but it doesn't include the year. He finds the tape they watched, which is volcanoes, dice, and an old woman saying someone will come for you, followed by a series of symbols that say you'll die in seven days. And before it can tell you how to avoid death, it cuts off. And then, this was confusing because the version I had showed commercial breaks that I was not expecting, so all of the sudden there were animated women jumping through the skies, and I just thought, damn, this version's weird before I figured it out. He gets the psychic involved and gives him a copy of the tape, and they start to unravel the mystery of the tape as the days count down, and they realize that what they're seeing is someone's memories burned into the tape itself. They learn about a psychic woman who died in 1956 who had a daughter named Sadako, and there's a calendar up on Kazuyuki's wall that's a bit hard to make out, but it looks like it says 1995 on it, so that's probably our year here, and his wife has watched the tape. They track down Shizuko's cousin, who said she threw herself into a volcano a long time ago, which we know to have been in 56, and that she was impregnated by the man who was touring with her as a psychic. Young Sadako was teased a lot, and she was a little girl when her mom died, so she was born around 1950 or so, and had psychic powers greater than her mother. She joined a theater group when she was a teenager, so in the mid-60s, and Kazuyuki says it was about 30 years ago, so that lines up. Turns out that she was also boning her dad, and they visit a doctor who said that around 30 years ago, she was in the hospital with her dying father, and they have an affair until he discovers that Sadako is a hermaphrodite. She attacks him, so he knocks her into a nearby well, and it turns out that the cabin was built over top of that well, so they dig up the floor and find it. And with time running out, Kazayuki sees Sadako and finds her remains. And the time passes, and he doesn't die, so they've broken the curse. The next night, though, when his seven days are up, Ryuji sees a naked Sadako appear, and she kills him. Kazu realizes that he escaped the curse by making a copy and showing it to Ryuji, so to save his wife, she must make a copy and curse someone else. Three years later, the franchise jumped to the big screen with another adaptation of the novel, also simply called Ringu. So this is a separate universe from the TV movie, since it's the same story, retold. This one begins on Sunday, September 5th. The only years that happened around that time are either 1992 or 1999, so this may be one of those? There's two girls here, and one tells the story of a boy recording a channel, which should have been blank, but instead had a woman saying he'd die in one week, and he did. Turns out that one of them saw a similar tape and then had a phone call saying that she had seven days. That night, something comes for her, and a reporter discovers that several people from the same high school all died at the same time. 
Reiko here takes the place of Kazuyuki from the novel and TV film, and she's a news reporter instead of a newspaper man, and she has a young son. The girl who died in the intro has been changed to her niece, and then it follows the basic plot of the TV movie and the book with the introduction of finding Tomoko in the closet and her personal photos, which tell us that we're set in 1997. And there's some distortion there. We're then told that it's Monday, September 13th, which didn't line up that way in 97, but I guess, I guess it did in this universe. But like in the last one, she goes to the cabin and finds and watches the tape. The imagery is pretty different here, but she still gets the call, and weirdly, there's this calendar up on the wall. It says it's September, but again, the days of the week don't line up with 97 and match up with either 92 or 99, but like I already said, these, these days are different. Instead of seeking help from just a psychic, she instead calls on her ex-husband, who's also a psychic, and he watches. They investigate, and a little later shot of the calendar clearly shows the 97, so that's, again, um, definite. We're told that the woman threw herself in the volcano 40 years ago, so around 57, so that's in line with the previous take, and little Yoichi watches the tape. The backstory is similar, and it's realized that the tape is Sadako's rage taken form, and they find the well. Here, instead of a random doctor, it's her father, the professor who pushed her into the well. And they again find her body and believe the curse to be lifted. Ryuji theorizes that Ikuma killed Sadako because she wasn't really his daughter, and her true father wasn't human. And of course, our long-haired friend comes for the X. And for the first time, we get the imagery of Sadako crawling from the well and coming through the TV, complete with that eye. Reiko figures out that copying thing and decides to save her son by giving a tape to her father. And I think this should be obvious, but again, this is a separate universe from the TV movie and a second continuity. So here's where it's interesting because on the very same day, the same day that Ringu was released, a sequel was also released. It seems the studio knew the novel and TV movie were a hit, so they made the two movies back to back with different teams and put them out on the same day. So also in 1998, we got Spiral, also known as Rasen. It picks up right where Ringu left off as a former classmate of Ryuji is told that his recent death and he's to perform the autopsy. They found his body yesterday, so it's still September of 1997, and they do the autopsy and find a note in his stomach. It's said that Reiko and Yoichi have gone missing, and Andu teams up with the student who found Ryuji's body and learns about the tape. But then we find out that both Reiko and Yoichi have just been killed in a car accident. But it seems the little boy was dead before the crash. And Andu himself lost a child two years ago. And it turns out that Reiko kept a diary that laid out the whole first film's plot. And we also learn that Reiko's father killed himself and they get the copy that she made. Andu watches the tape and immediately is visited by Sadako in a way we haven't seen before. This calendar lets us know that we're into October now, and this one again doesn't line up with 97, and instead that 99 or 92 line up, but it does match up with the dates from the last film, so the calendar is consistent. Her boss claims to have not watched the tape, but dies anyway, and Ando destroys the tape. It seems anyone who Sadako kills has a virus, and his week runs out and nothing happens to him. It turns out that the virus that killed the boss was mutated, and even though Andu sees her alive, we find out that Mai is dead and has apparently recently given birth, but no sign of a baby can be found. Also, the virus seems to be spreading without the tape, and it looks like just reading the journal spreads it, and then, Okay, bear with me, because it's a lot. We find out that Sadako put her own genetic information onto the tape and then went into Ando when he watched it and then went into Mai when he had sex with her. And then Sadako then birthed herself, 
killing Mai, and it's revealed that Ryuji was helping Sadako and not trying to stop her. And she promises to bring Endo's son back from the dead if he helps her, and they use her genetic material and implant it into Mai, which returns his son to the age that he died with all of his memories somehow. I do not know. Ryuji is brought back as well, and they plan to release the diary as a novel spreading the virus worldwide. And here's what happened. With this and Ringu released on the same day, the first film was a critical and box office success, whereas this one was not. It, it was torn apart in reviews and didn't perform well at all. And so, one year later, they tried again with Ringu 2. Once again directed by the 98 Ringu's Hideo Nakata. It picks up with Sadako's uncle viewing her body from the well, and they say that it appears that she died only a year or two ago and Reiko is missing. So it appears that this is immediately afterwards again, and it's still 1997 in September. Mai is here as well, and she teams up with one of Reiko's co-workers, and at her apartment, they find a destroyed tape. Reiko's father has been found dead, and apparently the idea of saving yourself by copying and sharing the tape is now well known, and Tomoko's friend from the beginning of the first film has been institutionalized. So by this point, it seems kind of weird because Mai is here a lot, and this seems to conflict with Razen, but not as much as when she encounters Yoichi and he's still alive. And then Reiko is here too, still kicking and not killed in a car crash. And this is past the point of when Razen had taken place. So it seems as if it's ignoring that entire film. And that's the case because when that film was a bomb, they went back to the drawing board with a more official sequel in a way with most of the original cast and the original director. So this is a separate continuity. Ozaki is given a copy of the tape from a high school girl and implored to watch it, and they're trying to, I guess, fix Masami by extracting the psychic energy from her head in a sort of science experiment and project it onto a blank tape. It's the cursed recording, but Mai trashes it, and oh, meanwhile, Dick Okazaki doesn't watch that tape, and Kane is killed. And I guess Yoichi has powers now because he does this which I believe is not meant to be funny, but absolutely is. <laughs> Reiko is then killed by a truck hitting her, which I suppose is not as trivial as being car crashed off screen, but it is still a bit of a random way to kill off your last film's main character. Oka is then attacked, even though he didn't watch the tape, so I'm not sure what the rules are anymore. And they also are able to reconstruct Sadako's face by using her actual skull. Mai takes custody of Yoichi, and it appears as if the evil energy is now within him. So they set up the same experiment to extract it from him and put it into a swimming pool where the water would dispel the energy. It goes wrong with Mai and Yoichi ending up in the well, but Ryuji's spirit appears to help out, but Sadako appears to try to stop them, but merely asks the question. It ends with Okazaki in the hospital, now haunted. Uh, it should be noted that this film is in no way based on any of the novels and is an entirely new story. So at this point, the series was gaining worldwide popularity and it was remade for another country. But oh no, we're not headed to the US just yet. Instead, in 1999, the same year as Ringu 2, there was the Ring Virus, a Korean adaptation of the novel or remake, if you will. It starts in a familiar way with the girl in the home alone, like the 95 version and the book, but follows a female protagonist like the 98 version. Instead of a son, Hong Sun Ju has a little girl, and again, it's her niece that died and was found in the closet. The story then pretty much follows the 98 version with even the tape being kind of similar, and we're told that it's Tuesday on December 1st, and that's how it fell in 1998. And even though the calendar didn't line up in the Japanese version, it's possible it does here, and this is 98. Instead of either a psychic or her ex, Sanju instead teams up with a doctor named Choi Yuk 
who's kind of a creeper, but but yeah, it, it's it, it's the same movie. Instead of Sadako, it's Park Unsa, and when they find her uncle, there's a big calendar up on the wall that again matches up with 98. So we're sticking with that, and they go with the book version of her death, where her killer is not her father, but instead a character that is her half brother. They do keep the hermaphrodite element though, and Unsa is played by Be Duna in her film debut. And she would go on to big success in both the Korean and American markets, starring in Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, The Host, The Zombie Show Kingdom, and also uh, Sense8, Cloud's Atlas, and Jupiter Ascending. The ending follows the 98 version pretty much to a T, including the TV crawl and wonky eye. One year later, in 2000, we went back to Japan for Ring Zero, Birthday, which starts with a young girl who has watched the tape talking about a dream where she was at the well, and we then bounce 30 years earlier, so probably late 60s, and we're told that she went to this school 11 years earlier in the late 50s then. There's a calendar here that's just too hard to make out, which is like filmmakers just straight up teasing me, but we know her mother died in 1956 and she went to the school a little after that, so like 57, 58, 59 or so, and this is 11 years after that, so this is like 68, 9, or 70 here. We meet Sadako in human form and she's learning to be an actress, although she makes the others nervous when she's around, giving them dreams of a well. Sure enough, a figure in white shows up and the lead actress ends up dead in a familiar fashion. And the reporter says that it's been 12 years since the big experiment with her mother. So this is likely 1968 here then, since the latest her mother was around was 1956, and this could be no more than 12 years later than that. It seems like Sadako suffers from blackouts and steps into the play's lead, and there's a reporter looking for her who was the fiance of the man who died at that demonstration all those years ago, revealing that there's two Sadakos, a light side and a dark side. But then, here's a surprise. Sadako also has the ability to heal people and makes this man walk again. On the opening night of the play, everything goes wrong when they play the recording of that infamous demonstration, causing Sadako to break down, so she has a carry moment, and the troop gangs up on her and attacks, killing her. They go to see Ikuma, and he reveals that she had split into two, and when the good side returns to life, the dark side appears and the two merge. She straight up then just kills everyone, and although she seemingly reverts to normal, Ikuma sends her down the well. By this point, the film had become enough known that there was interest in an American version, so in 2002, we got The Ring, now the fourth version of this same tale. This time, it's from Gore Verbinski and from DreamWorks with a close to $50 million budget. It starts like Ringu with the two girls, including Joan of Arcadia, and the one gets taken, of course. Uh, it's pretty identical. And again, we're following a reporter here played by Jet Girl, and her son is one of those, hey, I'm like eight, but also look 30 kid actors. They add a new wrinkle here with the kid being psychic and a little creepy, and Rachel's sister is Lindsay Frost, who we're gonna see melt in like a week or two here. We get the film's defining moment with the body in the closet and Seth cameos, and then the plot pretty much stays the same, but hold up. She gets to the cabin, and these kids chose to watch the haunted tape, when instead, they could have chosen your hunter from the future. They chose a horrible death instead of choosing unbelievable joy. The unbelievable joy that is your hunter from the future. Rachel watches the tape and shares it with her ex, who was also just in X this past year, but they also toss in a bit of Ringu too by visiting Becca in the hospital and then starts to solve the mystery, finding one of the most blatantly photoshopped pictures ever. We see articles about Anna Morgan and their horses who won third in 66, second in 67, and one in 68, which is said was last year, so this article is from 69. The horses all died in 78 and Anna died at 44 years old. Rachel sees way more visions than Reiko did, and of course Aiden watches the tape. 
From here, again, it just follows the 98 version pretty closely, except instead of meeting up with Sadako's uncle, we meet up with William Stryker, Anna Morgan's husband, and discover that Anna had a series of miscarriages back in 66, and there's a series of experiments from 78. We discover that the Morgans had a daughter named Samara, who had a power of projecting images, and she's Donnie Darko's little sister, but somehow I don't think Samara is into sparkle motion. Daddy Morgan kills himself, and why do these drawings of horses look like Seth from Superbad drew them? The ending pretty much just repeats the other versions with them recovering her from the well, although here she didn't survive the 30 years down there and died after seven days, which is why she killed you after one week. The finale is just the same, but just, just kind of blander than the Japanese version, and she figures out the copy thing, although with no parents featured in this one, it's not clear who they intend to show it to. And you know, there were some close calls, but you never see a date here, but let's roll with Real Time 2002. That was such a massive hit that it sparked a whole wave of other remakes of J-horror films, and of course, a sequel in 2005's The Ring 2. It begins with a young couple as Jake here desperately tries to get Sharon Carter to watch the tape, but it's too late. I should point out that the DVD came with a short film entitled Rings that detailed his week before from finding the tape to chronicling what leads up to the start of the film. Rachel and Aiden are back and he's still alive, so they got someone else to watch the tape instead of him, and they've moved to a small town. And Riley Denbo is here, and it's clear that she hasn't been there that long. She destroys the tape, and oh yeah, this one didn't have Verbinski return, so instead, they got Hideo Nakata, the director of Ringu and Ringu 2, to come on board. While at a flea market, Rachel sees some videotapes from Old School and Win a Date with Todd Hamilton, which came out in 03 and 04, so I, we're past that point, I guess? And, oh boy, those deers look insanely fake. Um, a good thing it's just a quick shot of them and it doesn't linger or anything. It's pretty clear that Samara is haunting them, tape or no tape, and oh, wow, uh, yeah, th those look silly. I, I, I don't get it, are real deer? Like, really hard to come by to use in the film or something? Samara starts to exert influence and tries to straight up possess Aiden, having him end up in the hospital where Celia Hodes strolls in, as does Mr. Brady. And we find out that while Samara was adopted, her birth mother tried to kill Samara as a baby. And it's kind of hard to tell here, but her mother is played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Rachel tracks her down and it's freaking Carrie, and Samara takes control of Aiden completely and kills Max. And here's a fun fact, Nakata hates this movie. He said that the studio basically controlled the whole thing and made him reshoot scenes and practically disowns it. There's a prescription bottle here that's dated 5505 and expires in 06, so we're definitely set in 05 here. And here's the thing, this is clearly not long after the first film. They act like the events are fresh, and they're treated like they just moved into town recently. Advanced material for the film actually stated that it would take place six months after the events of the first film, even though Aiden is clearly much older than that. But if we assume that those bills were prescribed at least a little recently, then this is definitely mid-05, with the first film in either early 05 or late 04. Samara really wants Rachel to be her mother? and she tries to drown her out, which works, but she ends up being dragged into the TV. She ends up back in the well and closes her in. Uh, she's then able to return to the real world with Samara defeated. Things were then quiet for a while and it wasn't until 2012 in Japan that the series would reemerge with Sadako 3D. It begins with a man dropping a woman into a well where there are several down there already, and then there seems to be some deaths that I'm sure would have been cooler if I were watching it in 3D, but I'm not, so they're a bit silly. Police investigating say that there's a rash of people watching a video and then committing suicide, and everyone has heard about it and people are searching it out. It's a video of the guy doing the live stream from the beginning, and when this guy searches it, there's a bunch of results in October of 2011, so it's possible that that's our date. The rules are different now in that anyone that watches the video online immediately dies via suicide or what looks like suicide, and it's the live stream and not the original tape. 
The stream is the work of Kashiwara, and their search also shows a bunch of results for October of 11. And they say his stream was 10 days ago. So we're in 11 now because there's even posters for 2011 on the wall of this classroom. The video is Kashiwara talking about resurrecting S, who he says will destroy humanity, and is then killed. And Sadako then emerges, but Akane's scream stops her? Uh, seems that she has telekinesis, which has people wary of her, and she has a boyfriend named Takanori, which was the name of the little boy at the ending of Razen, Ando's revived son. He gets taken by Sadako, and it's revealed that she is looking for a vessel, and she wants to live on in Akane. And it's said that she died decades ago, and Akane and Officer Koiso head to the location of the well. Seems Kashiwara was throwing women down there, and mutated versions that appear to have wandered in from a different film series emerge and attack, with Akane eventually using her powers to kill them all. She faces off with Sadako and finds Takanori, and look, it's not outright stated in this film, but this is the little boy from the end of Razen. This movie is based on the book S, and I should say kind of based because in the book it's clear that it's the same character, and they promoted this film as a follow-up to Razen. So this is in the same universe as that film, and this disregards Ringu 2 then. There's no mention of what happened to the virus aspect of that film, though, and Sadako takes over Akane, but Takanori finds her seemingly unharmed. There's then a confusing mid credit sequence with Kashiwada's landlord, like, like she was in on it, and then there's a confusing post credit scene with Kashi making a video saying, here we go again, insinuating that he's not actually dead. A mere one year later, that was followed by 2013's Sadako 3D2, and begins with Takanuri and Akane at the birth of their child, and that landlady is here again as well. It then jumps five years, so considering that it was October in the last one, the birth wouldn't have been until the following year, like 2012, and if this is five years later, it's 2017. The child has grown up into a little girl named Nagi, and strange things begin as a woman's internet compels her to stab herself. Nagi's being overwatched by Takanori's little sister, Fuko, and we discover that Akane died in childbirth. Turns out that Kashiwara was in fact alive, but was arrested and is awaiting execution, and Nagi's clearly got the evil in her as she gets revenge on a mean girl at the park, and then does her Carol Ann impression. Hey, now that I finally did the ring, now y'all can start harping on me about Poltergeist. People around her start killing themselves, and it turns out that Koiso survived the last film, but whoops, uh, not, not for long. The curse starts to spread, affecting a whole subway car, and Fuko goes to see Kashiwada in jail, and he tells her that the child is Sadako's, and the only way to stop things is for either Fuko to die herself or to kill Nagi. Fuko contemplates doing so, but is unable to when she starts crying. It, it turns out that Akane is not really dead, though, and that Nagi isn't truly Sadako, and if they are ever brought together, Sadako's full power will be unleashed into the little girl. Because it seems that Nagi wasn't to blame for the killings the entire time, and there's some fighting, and Fuko decides to let Nagi meet her mom for, for some reason. Before they can touch though, Akane is shot dead and Sadako tries to claim Nagi, but Fuko is able to save her. Kashiwada is executed, but reveals that Sadako's child has been a different girl this entire time and is still out there. Three years later, the inevitable happened as we got Sadako vs. Kayako in 2016, the crossover film between the Ring series and The Grudge. The film was first revealed as an April Fool's Day joke, but then became an actual thing. A thing they promoted uh, during baseball. It starts in a familiar fashion with a social worker checking on a woman only to find her dead and the cursed tape is there, as is Sadako. 
There's then a class on urban legends which tells of several tales, including the cursed house from The Grudge and the tape from The Ring. And he says that the legend began in the late 90s, but then says that the tape says that you'll die in two days, not seven. There's two students, Natsumi and Yuri, and they're trying to copy a wedding tape. And at the same time, there's Suzuka, whose family moves next to an old spooky and familiar house. Yuri buys an old VCR and the cursed tape is inside and they watch it. And the, the tape is dramatically different. So between the different tape and the changed time frame, it's likely this is a new and separate continuity. When talking about the cursed house, again, they say that the killings were decades ago. And in my grudge video, I established that this is also a new continuity for that series. So it's likely that this film exists on its own. The girl's teacher agrees to watch the tape and does so, becoming cursed himself. And he says that the experience of watching the tape differs from person to person and is a case to case thing. So it's possible that the curse can change. So there's a possibility you can put this into continuity with the first, uh, the first of them possibly on the Ringu and Ringu 2 timeline. The kids enter the grudge house and are all attacked by Kayako and Toshio. And they try to exercise Natsumi, which doesn't work and Yuri watches the tape in an attempt to help her, but no one makes a copy. A super psychic and his little girl sidekick show up and they say that getting rid of the curse by having people watch the tape is merely a rumor. And they decide to have Sadako and Kayako fight each other and they find a well in the backyard. Not the original well, but just a random well. Natsumi uploads the cursed video online and it shows the upload date as being in 2015. So that's our date here. And considering that the Sadako films talked about the curse already being online, that seems to confirm that this is not the same continuity. She's then killed by Sadako and Suzuka's family enter the house and are killed, but she escapes, although she's cursed. Their plan is to take cursed Yuri and Suzuka into the grudge house and let the demons fight each other and before they do, there's a calendar up on the wall. We don't see the year, but we do see that it's November and the days of the week do line up with 2015, so that's confirmed. That night, the girls enter the house and watch the tape there and Sadako shows up and pulls Toshio into the TV. And then Kayako shows up and they begin fighting. As a last resort, their plan is to use Yori as bait at the well and she jumps in and the two spirits merge into each other and sink down. They then seal the well, but unfortunately they crawl out as a single being called Sadakaya and attacks and it's left as a cliffhanger, but a post credit scene gives us a new version of the tape with the merged villain. One year later, back in the US, we return to America with 2017's Rings for the first entry in that continuity in 12 years. It starts with a guy on a plane who has seen the tape and his time is up and uh, Sadako sorry, Samara, have to remember which country I'm in, attacks. It then jumps ahead two years and there's a VCR at a junk shop and Leonard says that it's from the family of the plane crash guy. It has the tape in it still and he watches it. It's the classic version and he gets the call and weird stuff starts happening rather immediately. Then we have Julia and Holt here and he's off to college so they're long distance and her phone says that it's October and the days of the week line up where they fell in 2015 so it's likely that's the year here. Holt goes missing and she goes to find him and Gabriel was one of his professors and he's okay and, and more than a week seems to have passed so it's likely he got someone else to watch. But there's a bunch of photos with the warped faces all marked 2015 and they're all recent so this is definitely 2015. Seems the curse has spread all through the school and Samara comes for Sky here and we get our first bendy face in a while and Holt is cursed. And it's a system that Gabriel has set up and people are supposed to take turns watching to help other people out, but everyone is dropping out of the program. Julia chooses to watch the video in order to help him, but it seems that the curse is changing and moving quicker and she's unable to make a copy. Plus, her version now has new imagery, and in researching her, they say that no one knew who her birth parents were, which is a little off because they did know in the ring too, but it's just possible that whoever wrote that article she was reading didn't know that. They follow the clues to where Samara's body was buried, and they say the church was closed 13 years ago, and that lines up with the burial, 
So that would be 2002, which lines up with the first film, provided you ignore the 05 aspect of the film's sequel and simply had both of those films take place in 02. It seems Samara's body was moved, and then the Kingpin shows up and says her body was washed away in a flood, and Gabriel is killed in a car accident. Julia discovers that Samara's birth mother, Evelyn, was imprisoned under the church by a priest who had then impregnated her. Burke was that priest, and what's weird is that they say her mother disappeared 30 years ago, which would have been 1985, but like Samara died back in 1978 and was around 8, meaning she was born in... 1970 or so, so this would actually be around 45 years later. And considering that D'Onofrio was born in 1959 and would have to have been around 10 years old at the time that Evelyn got pregnant, I guess he's playing much older here? Burke blinded himself so that Samara can't hurt him since he can't see her, and they find her remains behind the wall. And somehow, she cures Burke's blindness and kills him. If it was that easy, I don't know why she didn't do it before. Um, they burn her remains, which is supposed to free her soul. But the next day, Julia hawks up a fly loogie and then sends the video to everyone on her contact list, revealing that Samara has been reborn in her body. The film didn't bomb, but it underperformed, which caused Paramount to rethink their slate of horror films, including another sequel, as well as backburnering a new Friday the 13th reboot. It's about to get more confusing because in 2019, there was the simply titled Sadako, which was Nakata's return to the series for the first time since The U.S. Ring 2. It begins with a young girl locked in a closet as her mother believes her to be the reincarnation of Sadako and tries to set her on fire. But then she actually does appear in the apartment and sets the little girl free. We then meet Mayu, a psychologist, and she finds out that her brother is one of those terrible YouTubers. And when the little girl is brought into her hospital, she's assigned to Mayu. Kazuma looks at his analytics for recent videos to tell us we're set in November of 2018. And the little girl displays some telekinetic abilities, which freaks out the other kids. And she also sees ghosts. Kazuma goes into the little girl's burnt apartment as a video challenge and vanishes and she finds a video online of him going in and she spots Sadako in it who also shows up in the hospital. This woman talks about a bunch of her friends dying in high school killed by Sadako and recaps her origin and she's soon taken and killed. Mayu sees a vision of some caves so she ends up going there where there's a shrine that was built and it was where parents would throw their unwanted children and Sadako would feed on them. While going there at night, Mayu is pulled into the cave where she finds Kazuma and has a vision of Shizuko, Sadako's mom, leaving her there and abandoning her in the cave but she didn't die and manifested her power in the cave. So. This is a pretty big divergence from her established history and defines this as yet another reboot and separate continuity unconnected to any of the previous films. It's weird though because earlier when they recap her origin they say that she was more powerful than her mother and her father threw her into a well so I'm not sure how to reconcile those two things especially since Nakata stated that this film is on the original timeline but it seems to contradict that one as well. Sadako appears and attacks, killing Kazuma and driving Mayu insane. The little girl, now free of influence, thanks her, but Sadako is still out there. And that brings us up to date as we await the release of Sadako DX, due out very soon in Japan, which the trailer tells us takes place in 2022. And the advance word has been pretty positive, but I'm not going to hold my breath on that. Uh, it's rumored to be yet another full-on reboot for the series, although it's hard to tell if it'll simply ignore all the other films or at least keep the original in play. But wait, there's more. Of course, this entire thing is based on a series of novels, of which there are six. Most of them have films based on them, yeah, somewhat. You see, the, the, the books dip way deeper into the whole sci-fi element that Razen introduced, and one of them is called Loop, and it has never been adapted. It takes place in an alternate universe in which a man creates a simulated reality designed to emulate ours, and it's this universe in which the events of the other novels take place. Uh, it's, yeah, it's kind, kind of weird. Um, but then 
There's the TV shows, and there were two, and they both aired in the same year. So, in 1999, there was Ring, the final chapter. Oh, Bullwinkle, that trick never works. It was 1999. There would be like 12 more Ring movies after this. The very first episode has a calendar right away showing it to be January, and the dates do match up with 1999. And it's not a continuation. It's actually a sort of adaptation of the original novel, once again, but with quite a few liberties taken. It ran for 12 episodes at around 45 minutes each and makes some slight changes, like Sadako lived in the well for 13 days, and it brings the whole viral aspect into it. And I mean virus virus, not, not like a viral video. That was followed by Razen, which was again separate from the films, but was a continuation from the final chapter. It ran 13 episodes and features a scene where Sadako attacks through the TV and this guy hits her on the head with an ashtray, which works. Um, but again, it's completely self-contained and not really required viewing. There have also been manga based on the series, although again, they're adaptations of the novels as opposed to continuations of the movie's chronology. The comics would actually adapt both sequels, Ringu 2 and Rosin, in different volumes, and much like the film series, just skips over the loop novel. Oh, and you know how in America, the Asylum makes thinly veiled knockoff of blockbuster films? Well, Asia does that too. First up in 2015, there was Hikiko-san versus Sadako, Hikiku was an OVA character who came after bullies, and they have her fighting Sadako here. And although this is the box art and the character is named Sadako, it's a different character in the film with a different last name. Then there's a pair of films from China called Bunshin Saba vs. Sadako and Bunshin Saba vs. Sadako 2, which were crossovers with a Chinese horror series called Bunshin Saba, which focused on a very obvious Sadako knockoff who wore a red dress instead of a white one. The character is basically Sadako and follows all the tropes and rules, and the films are actually a ton of fun, possibly more than Sadako vs. Kaiko even, but they're not official. There was also the Chinese Return of Sadako, or Sadako Returned. It was made after the first Bunshin Saba crossover and fills in the backstories of these versions of the characters and establishes this Sadako as having her own unique origin here. So, real quick, because I know it's confusing, let's take a look at what's connected to what. First of all, you have the 1995 Ringu TV movie, which is on its own. Next up, you have the Nakata series from Japan, which is Ringu, Ringu 2, Ring Zero, and apparently also Sadako from 2019. There's then the alternate Rosin timeline, which is Ringu, Rosin, Sadako 3D, and Sadako 3D 2. You also have the Korean timeline, which is literally just the one movie of the Ring virus, and the US timeline, which is Ring, Ring 2, and Rings. So there you have it. I, I don't even know how many movies that was. That, that was a lot of movies. Um, and yeah, a big mess in terms of continuity. A lot of reboots, possibly as many fractured uh, timelines as the Halloween series has. And I think this might be one of the first times that a sequel has actually gone back to connect to an abandoned timeline. It would be like if the next Halloween movie suddenly picked up again from Curse of Michael Myers or something like that. Um, I think that's the first time that that's happened. I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong on that. Let me know down below if, if I am. But um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was worth the wait. I know I've been promising the ring timeline for quite a while now. I hope that you enjoyed it now that it was finally here. And these movies are, um, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of uh, the ring timeline. There's a couple of these that are great and really amazing flicks. Um, I actually love Ringu. Uh, I actually enjoyed the TV version of Ringo, uh, Ringu a lot as well. I liked the American uh, remake, um, and I liked Ring Zero, and that's pretty much it. The rest of them are not that great. Uh, they're not terrible movies. It's not like they're hard to get through or anything, but I don't know. If you're a huge fan of these, tell me down below. If you like the American version more than you like the Japanese version or have never seen the Japanese version, put that down below as well too. If you think it is a travesty to say that the American version is better than the Japanese, tell me that. I want to hear all your opinions on these right down below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. If you enjoy what you're seeing on the channel, hit subscribe 
subscribe and please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines. You can help support this channel like these guys do and I appreciate it. And in the meantime, just keep on watching the videos and I'll see you very shortly. And most importantly, have a happy and safe Halloween.